Hi, it's Katrina. My friend David is actually going to be helping me out today, so we can give you a little bit more variety. Everyone say hi. Number 10, tarred and feathered. In 1765, the British colonists living in North America rejected the taxes the British government tried to impose. It was the beginning of what would become the United States of America's great freedom. The colonists realized they could decide their own taxes to pay to their own government instead of handing over their money to the British Parliament. After all, why should they give their money to a government on the other side of the ocean? At the time all this was going on, Boston was one of the biggest cities in North America. It became the center of protests against the British government. The main group of protesters were called the Sons of Liberty, later known as Patriots. Those who supported the British government were called Loyalists. In 1767, the British government raised taxes on tea. Then in 1773, the Tea Act was passed to enforce the taxes that weren't being paid by colonists. This led to even more protests. And finally, on December 16, 1773, history changed forever. Tea became a symbol of oppression and demonstrators in Boston had had enough. In a rage, they destroyed a ship loaded with English tea. This political protest went down in history as the Boston Tea Party. But here's one of the weirdest events that took place during this whole revolution. In January of 1774, Patriots in Boston captured a Loyalist and customs official by the name of John Malcolm. They were so sick of the Loyalists that, to send a message, they tarred and feathered him. They stripped him down to the waist, soaked him in tar, threw feathers all over him, and then forced him to apologize for his behavior and denounce King George III. After this, John Malcolm got on a boat and moved to England. Number 9. The Egyptian Strike The first recorded strike in human history happened sometime between 1170 and 1152 BC. For two decades before the beginning of the strike, the great king Ramesses III had done his best for the Egyptian people, and as he approached his 30th birthday, the Egyptians started making plans for a great festival in his honor. But trouble had already been brewing. Three years before the festival, monthly wages of tomb builders who had worked on the place of truth were given to them late. There had been some confusing negotiations between scribes and workers to get the tomb builders compensation while they were forced to wait for real payment. But it only got worse and worse, and eventually the entire system of payment for the necropolis builders broke down. The workers waited 18 days and then refused to wait any longer. They laid down their tools and marched through the city. They shouted that they were hungry, they held demonstrations in front of the mortuary temple of Ramses III, and even staged a sit-in at the temple of Thutmose III. Egyptian authorities had no idea how to deal with such an event, as never in the course of human history had such a thing happened. The government ultimately had no choice but to give rations and payments to the workers, who then returned to their labor. It was such a successful tactic that historians believe it continued to be used throughout the rest of the reign of King Ramses III. Number 8. Napoleon's Fight Against Murderous Rabbits The great French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte was defeated in an epically humiliating fashion at Waterloo on June 18, 1850. It was the final defeat of the French army, but not Napoleon's only indignity. He also got into a battle with some rabbits that nearly left him dead in the summer of 1807. Napoleon had just signed the Treaties of Tilsit to end the War of the Fourth Coalition. To celebrate, he went on a rabbit hunt. He had his chief of staff collect the bunnies. Napoleon invited the most prominent men in his military. Then hundreds and some say thousands of bunnies were released from their cages for the men to hunt. Napoleon and the men had expected the rabbits to run away in terror, but instead, a mob of rampaging bunnies hopped straight towards Napoleon. The crowd was laughing nervously, but then they began to shriek in horror as it was clear Napoleon was in some kind of danger. The bunnies started hopping up his legs and swarming him with clearly evil intent. 
Of course, Napoleon was never actually in any danger of being killed by the rabbits, but it was humiliating because when he failed to beat the rabbits off his legs and they just kept coming, he ran away. Napoleon literally fled from a throng of tamed rabbits and hid like a coward in his carriage until they finally left. In front of all his generals and all the most important people in France, Napoleon ran away from the rabbits like a terrified child. Number 7. The Salem Tomato Trial 200 years ago, tomatoes were considered evil. Eating tomatoes was considered sinful by the church and an obstacle to reaching salvation. The history of the tomato in Europe goes back to about 1519 when it's believed the famous Spanish conquistador Hernando Cortes, the man who conquered the Aztec, brought the seeds back to southern Europe. Then throughout the 16th century, Europeans didn't eat tomatoes so much as they grew them for ornamental display. In the 1700s, people actually feared that eating tomatoes would kill them. They thought the fruit was poisonous, even though that's obviously not the case. The truth was that people's tableware contained significantly high lead content, and the acidity in the tomatoes brought out the poison and killed people. But of course, medieval Europeans couldn't exactly put two and two together, and so they entirely blamed the evil tomato. The tomato's reputation grew worse and worse until the year 1820. That was when a man named Robert Gibbon Johnson participated in the Salem Tomato Trial in New Jersey. The entire point of the trial was to prove once and for all that tomatoes could be eaten as ordinary food. So a large group of people were brought to the courthouse in Salem, where Robert took the stand with a basket of fresh tomatoes. To prove his point, he sat there and ate the entire basket of fruit. The crowd was expecting a violent sudden death, but that death never came. Robert lived, the myth of the evil tomato was debunked, and from then on it became a widely accepted food. If any fruit had to go on trial, which do you think would be most evil and deserving? Let me know your thoughts in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe before the end of the video. Number 6. Unsinkable Sam All kinds of bizarre things happened during World War II, but one of the weirdest that most people haven't heard of involves a cat. The cat was originally named Oscar, but became known as Unsinkable Sam because he was on board three ships that sank and managed to survive each time. Unsinkable Sam began his naval career in the Nazi fleet on board the Kriegsmarine, but he ended up working for the British. He was on board the legendary Nazi ship the Bismarck when it sank, then the HMS Cossack, and finally the HMS Ark Royal. It was a weird coincidence because the HMS Ark Royal was crucial in sinking the Bismarck. It was almost like wherever the cat went, the boat sank. Following the war, the cat lived a long life until 1955. He was so famous that the artist Georgina Shaw Baker created a pastel portrait of Sam that's still hanging at the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich. Number 5. The Very Bad Surgeon In the 19th century, Dr. Robert Liston was considered the finest surgeon of his day. He was famous for his lightning-fast amputations, but ultimately went down in history as a miserable failure. Before his grave mistake, he had an almost flawless record. Only about 1 out of 10 of Liston's patients died on the operating table, which was considered impeccable for the day. The doctor was so fast with his amputations that he let his speed get the better of him. He performed an operation so quickly that as he was slashing with his knife, he accidentally cut his assistant's fingers when he sliced through the patient's leg. And in the same careless motion, he slashed through the coat of one of the spectators. The patient and the assistant both died from infections. The spectator that had been slashed through the coat was so scared that he had been stabbed that he literally dropped dead of shock. To this day, the doctor's botched amputation is the only known surgery to boast a 300% mortality rate. He went in trying to heal one person and ended up killing three of them. Number 4. The Mutiny on the HMS Bounty In 1789, just three weeks into a journey from Tahiti to the West Indies, a mutiny took over the HMS Bounty. The vessel was seized by the master's mate, Fletcher Christian. 
The captain, William Bly, and 18 of his supporters were set adrift in a boat, and the mutineers set a course for Tubai, near Tahiti. It wasn't the most unusual thing to happen in the 1700s, but it was a pretty extreme uprising. Why would the crew do this? It's because they were sick of working and wanted to live a nice, quiet life with the Tahitians. Why would they want to spend the rest of their lives working on a stinky old boat, going back and forth across the world when they could just turn around and go back to Tahiti and enjoy the lush scenery, the lovely hospitality, and the laziness of island life? Well, that's pretty much what the mutineers did. They sailed to the island of Tubuai and tried to set up their very own colony. But it was an utter failure, and they had no choice but to sail back to Tahiti. They stayed there for a short while, but were worried that the British authorities would come back and arrest them. So Fletcher Christian and eight other men, along with a dozen Tahitian women, sailed around the South Pacific looking for their own island paradise. They found it on Pitcairn Island. It's an isolated volcanic island about a thousand miles, 1,609 kilometers, from Tahiti, where the mutineers lived in total isolation. They weren't discovered until 1808, when an American whaling vessel was drawn to the island by the smoke from their cooking fires. A man named John Adams was leading the group, the only survivor of the original mutineers. According to what John told the Americans, all the original settlers died on the island by contracting weird diseases. John Adams was the only one to survive, and he went on to serve basically as the king of Pitcairn Island until 1829. There is still a community of the mutineers' descendants living on the island to this day. Number 3. Flower Sack Fashion Here's something you may not know about the Great Depression. Times were so lean in the 1930s that companies began making flower sacks with colorful patterns. The colorful patterns were for women who actually made dresses out of the flower sacks because nobody could afford to purchase real clothing or buy real materials. It started when the manufacturers of flour learned women were using the sacks, which happened to be made of cotton for all kinds of usable goods for their families. They made kids' clothing out of flower sacks, they used them as diapers, for dishcloths, and pretty much anything else. It was basically free fabric, and so, to help out families, the company started packaging the flour with pretty patterns. The ink of the labels was easily washed off, and then the sacks could be used like normal chunks of fabric. And this was only 90 years ago. Even though you can walk into a Walmart and buy a shirt and some pants for $5 today, it might not always be so easy. Just like people from the Great Depression, we could all end up wearing flower sacks a few years down the road. Number 2. The Weird Death of King George V Just before midnight on January 20th, 1936, King George had one of the strangest deaths in English royal history. His health had been declining in the previous months because of a chronic lung issue that first reared its ugly head in 1928. But it wouldn't be until 1986 that the diary of the king's physician, Lord Bertrand Dawson, came to public light. In the physician's journal, he clearly describes how he decided to kill the king himself with an injection of morphine and cocaine straight into his jugular vein. It was considered euthanasia, yet the king hadn't anything to say about it. According to what Dawson wrote in his journal, he wanted to grant the king a painless death even though he hadn't agreed to it. He also wanted to kill him at night, so that his death would be in the morning paper instead of in the evening journals, which were considered less savory at the time. In other words, the king was technically murdered by his own physician simply so it would appear in the morning's newspaper, and nobody found out about it for 50 years. Number 1. The Duke and the Wine Barrel George Plantagenet, 1st Duke of Clarence, was an English nobleman from the 15th century. Just like King George V 500 years later, the Duke of Clarence also perished under extremely unusual circumstances. He died by being thrown into a vat of wine. The bizarre death came because of an equally bizarre scheme by the Duke to steal the throne for himself. His brother, Edward IV, had become the first English king from the House of York in 1461, after the death of Henry VI. George wanted that power for himself, 
George and one of his conspirators, named John Stacy, were caught plotting to overthrow the king by using the black arts. This was a serious crime, and George was arrested in 1477 and imprisoned. In 1478, he was executed by being dunked into a barrel of wine. At least, that's the historical rumor. We don't have any real proof that he was killed in a wine barrel, but that's what historians generally agree happened. It was a far cry from the usual beheading that went with a charge of treason against the king. Thanks for watching. Which one of these historical events shocked you the most? Let me know in the comments below, and if you haven't yet, remember to subscribe to help support the channel. I'll see you again soon for more of history's craziest secrets. Bye.